Welcome to the seventh conversation in UCC's Global Speaker Series. We're delighted to welcome our distinguished guests this evening. Jim Clarkin is CEO of Oxfam Ireland and an Executive Director of Oxfam International. He's an adjunct professor at the College of Business and Law in UCC, a board member at Cork University Business School and a regular contributor to several of the university's programmes. Jim was appointed by the President of Ireland to the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission and was recently recommended to represent Ireland at the EU Fundamental Rights Agency. He was appointed by the Count Corla to the Forum on Family Friendly and Inclusive Parliament to recommend a transformation in how the Oireachtas operates. Jim is a leading commentator on global issues relating to human rights, sustainable development, inequality, the rights of migrants and refugees, and human and business rights. And he's highly regarded as a thought leader in the sector. Prior to joining the international development sector, Jim worked across a range of industries, including energy, pharma, environmental, construction, brewing, and startups. Jim has been involved at board level in several nonprofit organizations in the arts sector and in business representative bodies. Jim is a passionate advocate for the rights of women and has driven a gender focus at Oxfam, advocating economic empowerment for women and greater participation in political and business leadership. Thea Hennessy was appointed Dean of Cork University Business School in 2017. With a history of business education dating back over a century, the business school at UCC is Ireland's largest provider of undergraduate business education in Ireland, with a student body of over 3,500. Thea is also Professor of Agri-Food Economics and has published more than 200 articles and reports on a range of issues, including the impact of public policy on farm performance, the implications of environmental policy and climate change on food production, and the role of technological developments in the food sector. In addition to her role as Dean, Thea is also holds a number of directorships and serves on a number of boards, including the Board of Chagask, the Agriculture and Food Development Authority of Ireland, the Irish Management Institute, and as Honorary Secretary of Cork Chamber of Commerce. This evening, our speakers are going to discuss the role of business in achieving sustainability and protecting and supporting human rights. Jim and Thea, a very warm welcome to you both. Thanks, Karen. Hi, Jim. Nice to see you again. Thanks, Thea. Great to be here. Good, Jim. Um, before we get into sustainability, human rights and the role of business, given that this is an alumni event, I might start off and ask you about your history in UCC, what you studied with us and, and the memories you have of your time here. Uh, well, I was lucky enough to do an MBA uh, in UCC uh, in 2001-2002, so quite a long time ago now, but uh, <laughs> uh, and it was it was an incredible experience, I have to say. Um, I had studied elsewhere previously, uh, and I had been working for a number of years uh, prior to joining the MBA program. And I have to say, I was I was very nervous joining it. I wasn't sure what kind of uh, what kind of group I would be, whether I would be be good enough to be part of it. Uh, and uh, I, I joined a, an extraordinary class of of really interesting and and motivated people, uh, and learned so much through the program. And the program was really really strong. And I've uh, been you know I, I found myself leveraging it. Uh, since then, and and it carries such tremendous credibility in Ireland and across across the world, really. And the, and the reputation of the college is one that that is brought widely known uh, everywhere I go, and it's it's a really powerful one to bring with me. So I'm very very proud of that. Uh, it was it was doing the MBA isn't quite the same as as doing an undergraduate uh, and being an undergraduate student uh, and living that life, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, but we we managed to squeeze a bit of fun into it as well, and uh, and in fact, some of my best friends to this day are are people that I was in class with during that MBA time. Mm. No, I mean it's true. It takes a lot of commitment to pursue an MBA. I know most people are working and they're in campus on Saturday mornings and doing projects over weekends and everything. And I think maybe that's why the bonding that happens at the MBA is so strong because I know you've kept very good contact with uh, your classmates. And what was the decision? Um, that motivated you to do an MBA? Were you working in business at the time or had you already moved into the not-for-profit not sector? 
No, I, I've been working in business and uh, my background, I had, I had a BCom from, from another college and I'd done a, a postgraduate, which which uh, brought me to a placement in West Cork and Clonakilty, which was a, an, an amazing experience, a, a small but growing company with a, a very open and, uh, you know, progressive uh, managing director who gave me huge amount of scope to do all kinds of interesting things. So we, we ended up developing a whole export wing to the organization, set up a manufacturing facility in the UK, you know, products that were produced in West Cork were in Hong Kong and all over the world. Uh, and but I realized that I, I wanted to do more and I wanted to, I, I felt that the timing was right to have that further education and the MBA was was the way to do it and also for career progression. So it was mm. a it was a, a very in, instrumental part of, of my journey. Mm. Great. I love the way you say you studied at another university and you don't name them. You're very uh, tactful there. <laughs> and maybe I can give out give a shout out to the MBA while we're online as well to say that we did gain international accreditation for the MBA program over the last year from AMBA. So the program has really gone from strength to strength. And you've been a great supporter of both the MBA and the business school by being a member of our advisory boards. That's something I really appreciate as well. And maybe before I come to, you know, what the connection is between Oxfam and the business school and your interest in business, what took you into the nonprofit world then? And did you always have a, a vocational calling or a family background in, in that kind of uh, field? Gosh, the word vocational frightens me. Um, <laughs> I, I, I suppose, I no, I, I had always had a sense that, you know, that there were grave injustices in the world. And, and even as a kid, I remember just, not understanding the the concept of people somewhere else starving or being in, in such desperate need that that we know exists and um, and you know i'd always had an ambition to do something now i probably thought i was going to do something on a voluntary basis for a short period of time and then kind of convert a commas get on with my life whatever that meant um but uh and and in a way when you when you grew up in ireland at the time that i did and when you graduated the time i did i mean getting a job holding on to a job progressing through your career was was vital and the opportunities there weren't also many opportunities to do other things and you were kind of encouraged to to keep keep moving and um, but i had always had that ambition and following the the mba i i ended up working in a company in in waterford a large company that supplied the the gas uh, pharma um, and manufacturing industries uh, and uh, it was after that time that I realized, look, you know, if I don't do something now, I'll never do it. So I, I decided to to quit all of that. Uh, and uh, and I went and volunteered to run a, a large health and water and sanitation program in South Sudan. Now, I didn't realize um, as a volunteer, uh, I, I didn't realize that there wasn't a queue for that particular gig. Uh, I, I, you know, it was <laughs> because it was a, it was a it was a challenging place to be, but it was an extraordinary experience. And I guess I found that when I came back from that, it was very difficult to 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 go back into doing what I'd been doing before. And I was very fortunate that opportunities arose uh, to, I suppose, to use the different skills that I that I picked up, both the business skills and the and the kind of uh, development stroke humanitarian skills that that I'd learned as I went along. And and this role that I have kind of is a perfect marriage of all of those. I hope. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So maybe tell us a little bit about Oxfam in Ireland, because people might be familiar with your, your funding model and the kind of services you provide. Sure, sure. Well, Oxfam is is the largest uh, development humanitarian and I suppose advocacy organization of its kind in the world. So we operate in in roughly 70 countries um, and we have 21 what we call affiliates. So we're all independent organizations that work together under the umbrella of Oxfam International and uh, I'm, I'm in a director of that organization, but we do work very closely together. In, in Ireland, we're, we're Ireland's oldest uh, nonprofit uh, NGO working in international development. We've been here for since the 1950s, the late 1950s, mm -hmm. and we're an independent Irish organization. We're an all island organization, so north and south, and we've, we've a very large, a broad body of, of support across the island of Ireland and have done for many years. Our focus as Oxfam is on kind of three main areas. One is humanitarian work, which is what people would most associate, I suppose, with organizations like that. It, us, it's life-saving when you see an emergency happen or a conflict. We're there, we're working with communities on the ground to provide life-saving life -saving support. Oftentimes in our case, it's water and sanitation. It's kind of our global expertise and we're recognized across the world as being leaders in that area. 
we leave food and health medicine and so on to other organizations who are equally qualified in those spaces so when an emergency happens we we, we come together as clusters to kind of work on those areas and and ireland we're we're, we're a part of that and then we work on on what we call development so this is working across a whole range of areas with a very strong focus on women's rights and development uh, but looking at issues from health education uh, land rights um you know business small business working with small business in developing countries and so on to to support communities and individuals to develop their own pathway out of extreme poverty yeah. and so it's very much led community led so working through partners it isn't us traveling to different parts in, in our case from ireland we do a lot of work in east africa central africa and southern africa some some in the, some in in east and in the pacific as well but the african that part of africa is our primary focus and other parts of oxfam work in other areas like latin america and asia and so on and um, but we have so we have very strong relationships with that but we don't we don't parachute people in from here to tell people in tanzania how they should be running their their society or their community it's it's about it's about communities themselves and partners or partner organizations working with us and us providing technical expertise and funding and so on where we can and then the third area of work is is advocacy and campaigning and this is because and, and we like to think that as oxfam it's it's where we differentiate ourselves in, in if if we like and in, from others in, in our sector in that we we look at the the barriers that keep people locked in poverty we look at the, the barriers that create these huge global inequalities that we're aware of and then a, a wide range of issues within that and then we look to to leverage the experience that we have at community level, at country level, at national level, and at global level to, to influence decisions that affect people across the world. So they're, they're the kind of three pillars, if you like, and that with that, what we call influencing or advocacy being, you know, the, the, the one that is, is the, the capstone, I suppose, of, of yeah. all the other work. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I didn't realize Oxfam was so long in Ireland, actually, and, and one of the first uh, NGOs. Like when you mentioned the three pillars are humanitarian, the community-led approach and advocacy it doesn't scream the world of business to me it sounds very far removed actually from what we think about uh, in the business context or in the business school yet you're a very valuable contributor to our advisory board of the business school do you do you think that those two issues are very far apart i'm sure you don't that's why we're here tonight to talk about the role of business and tackling some of these issues but uh you know what's your view on that well, for, I, I don't at all. But first of all, we're, we're a business too, by the way. We have a we have a forty seven retail outlets across the island of Ireland. We we have a we're a fairly large organisation. We have you know hundreds of staff and thousands of volunteers. We, you know, so it's a, it's a big body. So we run like a business, I suppose. But but I but I also have always felt that uh, the business has a and and Oxfam believes that business has a, a vital role in in. In, in overcoming poverty, respecting human rights and empowering women. I mean, the, the, the reach, the scale, the operations, the supply chains, the resources, the insights, the influence that business have is, dwarfs anything that Oxfam can do. I mean, uh, private sector business is the largest employer in the world. I mean, and employment leads, supports people to lift themselves out of poverty. So mm -hmm. for me, the, the role of business is, is vital and, and we, you know, we very much embrace businesses being involved and and understanding the kind of challenges that are faced in developing countries and elsewhere and and playing their part in transforming the world and we see this you know the, you know how that is likely to to continue to develop in 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 the next while i mean there's there's so much that business can do as a force for good um and we, we see this kind of transformation coming and business being a vital part of it and I suppose sometimes when we think of business in the developing world, we think of, you know, maybe the capitalist approach to sourcing cheap labor. And we think of some of the controversies we had around, um, you know, closed manufacturing in particular in Asia and very poor working conditions. Like, is that still a problem? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? And what's Oxfam's role in? Well, well, we, well it, it, it is a huge problem. I mean, there's no question about it that the... The role of business, um, and this is something that I, I think would be useful to discuss here, is that the the role of of businesses here and in this part of the world, in Ireland, in Europe, and in the global north, as we describe it, um, have implications across the world. Uh, and Ireland is a big, or is a global, an open economy, uh, which is 
large and has a very large footprint and it has a large footprint across across its value chains and so um what we are seeing is that more and more businesses understand this they realize this and they have many have been working towards voluntary kind of guidelines the the un uh, guidelines for example on sustainable business and on protecting human rights but um it's it's a it's a it's a relatively small number of of organizations thus far and it's those that are kind of at the front line of public um scrutiny and we've been involved in that public scrutiny we've worked very closely with companies like unilever like mns uh and many others to to work with them on supply chain issues and our view is that um businesses need to take responsibility for for everything that happens from a human rights perspective uh, throughout their value chain so mm. and that you know up to now that has been done on a on a voluntary basis but we see that there's a there's a growing movement uh, both at the european level and wider for a mandatory system of of a corporate governance arrangement that ensures that uh, due diligence is carried out across across value chains and we see that it's not just us i mean the economist uh, did a survey recently and they said 83% of business leaders believe that businesses uh, and not just governments have a role to play in protecting human rights and you know we see that 81% of the irish public believe the same and we've seen you know a lot of movement of companies already because they they're preempting this and they're seeing both the challenge and the opportunity for themselves uh, in ways that they can move you know move quicker than the others if you like and you know that that applies across a whole range of areas i mean if you look at uh, shareholders uh, we, there's a group of uh, shareholders called the investors for human rights alliance uh, that are moving 4.3 trillion dollars of their of their funds to to organizations that have a proven human rights track record and mm -hmm. um, the abp uh, dutch pension fund are divesting 15 billion and um, the asset managers fidelity are are going to have their portfolio that you know that in terms of emissions over the next 20 years so more and more companies large companies and and medium and smaller sized companies too are understanding that the challenge is here there are tremendous demands from consumers and we've been involved as a you know from our i suppose we do a, have a kind of an insider outsider approach so we work with companies and we also work with consumers as part of a public campaigns approach to to put pressure on companies and we've done mm -hmm. We had a we had a campaign a few years ago called Behind the Brands, which was in looking at the top ten food and beverage companies in the world, and we we mobilised public to put pressure on the likes of Coca Cola and Nestle and and Unilever and others to to look at key aspects of their supply chains to see where there may be vulnerabilities, for example, on land grabbing, on water, the use of water within their within their supply chains, uh, on women's rights through their supply chains, and you know we. We, the, the intention was rather than naming and shaming, it was a kind of a race to the top. So we created this level of competition amongst these yeah. companies, and it was quite effective. And the commitments made were were substantial, and and have you know have lived up to that to this day. But uh, that's that's a that's a relatively small group of albeit very important and influential companies. You know, we want to see this in a you know carried out in a much broader way, and and certainly we believe that this is where it's headed. Um, Mairead McGuinness is leading this at the European Commission, and mm -hmm. you know when it comes into being, Ireland will will have to follow suit. And and Ireland itself, uh, Ireland obviously, we're we're members of the UN Security Council. We we were elected on the basis of our human rights record, and that we are as Oxfam part of the uh, Ireland uh, Business and Human Rights Network with the Irish government. Uh, and there's a, there, there will be publishing a plan in the not too distant future, looking to see how this will will become mandatory so um, there the appetite is there the need is there um, and the abuses unfortunately have continued and they you know they 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 happen in so many different ways and so many invisible ways um, and we just believe that it's it, it isn't good enough anymore for companies to say well that happens that's my supplier and you use a really good example of the of the garment industry i mean what happened in the rana plaza was was shocking uh, 1100 mostly women uh, died in that, uh, and the impacts to to this day, the their, the compensation hasn't been hasn't been received by their families. So you know, and that was on the back of you know products that we all wear. So mm. uh, so it is vital for for companies to understand that and to you know to look at the implications for themselves, both 
both from their, um, you know, the, the possibility of having uh, legislative or having having um, litigation at some point down the line, mm. uh, massive um, uh, reputational risk for companies uh, if they don't if they don't act in the right way, as well as being the right thing to do. And look, it's, it's certainly in my view, having worked in business for as long as I have, and working with people like yourselves and working with business leaders, you know, most people don't go out to cause harm. You know, they they, they don't, and, and they certainly would be appalled to think that anything is happening within their value chains that are causing causing the kind of harm that, that we talk about. But now it's up to the companies themselves to be much more aware of that and to be transparent about it, to publish and to and to invest in, in what's needed to make sure that they, they mitigate any risk and then they then they remedy any issues that may arise. Yeah, that's really interesting, Jim. A lot there in that answer from, you know, the power of investors and pension funds and the likes of those to the to the power we have ourselves in terms of consumers. And I'm familiar with behind the brands. I teach international food business to commerce students and we look at the behind the brands actually. And um, for some of the global supermarket chains, how they have improved year on year and it just goes to prove once you measure something and publish it people will respond and they will try to do better better you know um coming back to the power of the consumer then because i suppose we could we can all do something and and focusing still on human rights because i think we need to touch on climate change as well it's it's so important at the moment obviously you know you 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 mentioned some statistics there about people's willingness um or that their desire to see things change but is that followed by how they spend their money do you think and maybe tell us a little bit about your fair, fair trade movement. Um, we'd be familiar with that, I guess, um, the coffee industry in particular. I know when I was a student in, in England myself doing my PhD, when we went to the canteen, this was back in the late 90s, you were asked, did you want to pay five pence more for a fair trade coffee? But I don't hear that question being asked anymore. So where is the fair trade movement and, and how are consumers spending their pounds and euros at the moment? Well, we, we founded the fair trade movement uh, globally, Oxfam, uh, and um, and in fact, controversially, when I when I took over this role <laughs> that I have now, um, I I disposed of some of the fair trade uh, work. Uh, the reason being that it had been so successful that it had gone mainstream. Uh, we used to retail fair, fair trade and do things like that, and we said, look, actually, when you can get fair trade coffee in your corner shop or in your major supermarket. Uh, in every, pretty much every single major supermarket in Ireland, um, there's been a transformation. And in fact, the the limited value that we could add to or to that at that point didn't didn't really add up. But I mean, the I and and the fair trade movement is important, and it is it it's an important opportunity for for active um, uh, consumers to 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 reach out and to you know to to consume in a certain way. But it's very much again it's very much voluntary and you're depending on the most enlightened and you know those who have time and everybody's busy with families and work and the, all the mm. other kind of challenges that are there to to have to think about these things and you know it was certainly a vital part of creating greater awareness and certainly supporting certain farm uh, farmers in in developing countries but really our own belief is that unless you unless you transform that into something that it is mandatory, that that really ensures that companies um, don't have any choice in this, if I may say it mm -hmm. so, so bluntly, that that um, really that because we've noticed that you know it will only take you so far the, the the voluntary aspect of this, and it has taken the world a distance, but we don't believe that it's going to it's going to get us to where we need to be unless there's a there there is a a proper mandatory due diligence in place i just give you an example of it. we 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 carry out what are what are called um human rights impact assessments and you you mentioned supermarket chains we, we worked with a company called sok in finland they're the largest uh, food retailer in finland they have revenues of 11.5 billion and we worked at, so this uh, this is a uh, working with us so we have specific expertise on working with communities because a lot of a lot of companies obviously don't have access to the communities themselves but through our networks and through our partners we can do that and we were able to work with with them and, and they were very open and transparent and brave if i could say in in first of all bringing us in and second of all being willing to share this information that that exposed them in 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 some ways and um, and they wanted us to look specifically at the tomato at their tomato um supply chain and specifically at italy 
I hadn't realized this, but Italy produces 40% of, of global tomato for the for the entire consumption. And we were looking at at elements of, of farming and processing tomatoes in, in the southern uh, part of Italy where most of that is carried out. Uh, and we found that there were, you know, so many risks and so many problems in relation to forced labor, low wages, um, excessive working hours, and health and safety risks. And uh, even during the course of a six month um, study, uh, 16 workers died uh, just in transport, being transported to work in these overcrowded vans and stuff. Uh, Southern Italy is particularly vulnerable to um, exploitation of migrant workers and of people who've crossed the Mediterranean who were in, in, in seeking refuge here in Europe or seeking work. And because that, they, they sometimes come off the radar and they can be abused quite easily. So uh, it was to the credit of SOK, they have 30,000 supply chains that they're willing to look at this and willing to to put it out there to say, look, actually, we've come up with this problem, and and we've now we've now looked to to transform things, and they've made tremendous changes. And um, closer to home, um, I, I'm speaking at a, an event with IBEC recently, and um, we're working with IBEC on on I suppose communicating to businesses about you know the possibility for human rights due diligence, the fact that it doesn't have to be something scary, that it can be. It can be done in a managed way, in a manageable way, and we're very happy to support companies doing it. But in the course of it, um, Fives were in the room also, and they, they have some really interesting, done some really interesting work. Again, on the back of recognizing that they had some problems in their in their value chains, and they needed to to do something about it. So, look, it's it's really positive that there are uh, progressive companies that are willing mm -hmm. to do this. But you know, in order for it to become mainstream fully, we we will need to look at something more substantial in time. Yeah, I mean, the tomatoes example is, you know, a really worrying one, because I think if you go into the supermarket and you buy something that's product of the EU, you assume that all of yeah. those things are above board and regulations have been followed and human rights have been protected and safeguarded. So, you know, it's it's worrying to think that products we consume that are produced so close to home uh, still can have that impact, you know. And how far are we then from having, so like, you talked about um, companies coming on board very much from a voluntary perspective or because uh, shareholders and funders are demanding it, but how far are we from having some sort of um, governance code or, or compulsory reporting on these things? Uh, not far at all. I mean, as I say, it's it's working its way through the commission at the moment. Um, and, you know, as part of the, the, the UN guiding principles, each country is supposed to have this already. But again, they have been they have been mostly voluntary. Um, whereas what what is going to happen now is is something that will be compulsory. Um, France and Germany and I think it was one of the Nordics has also has already has jumped ahead and has already introduced laws. And there's already litigation happening in French courts in relation to specific areas of human rights in the in the value chains of companies. So it is it is real. It's coming down the track, and and it will have implications for companies here. Um, who who are in breach or, or find these things. And I suppose our, our message really is for companies to start thinking about it now rather than it being foisted upon them. There, there are things that companies can do and there's a there's a bit of, I suppose, self-analysis to be done. We'd be, we'd be very keen that it isn't just done at, in the, the sustainability department or in the, you know, the CSR department or whichever it is, that it's, it's a whole of organization approach. Um, to understanding where the risks might be. And, and we describe them as risks because they are risks to companies and risks to their sustainability and to their reputation and so on. But there are also great opportunities here too. I mean, you see that progressive companies are leaping ahead in terms of consumer sentiment, in terms of you know removing those kinds of um, real risks to their, to their supply chains and um, getting, you know, looking at things like shorter supply chains, looking at greater um, understanding of what's happening across their network getting greater buy-in and the other the other state group of stakeholders which is vital here are, are employees i mean we look more and more we're seeing that um particularly younger employees if i can say and millennial, millennials and the younger generations are are very fixed and, and very determined to work for organizations that have similar values to themselves mm -hmm. and and will be appalled if if you don't live up to those expectations and and i mean that again we we all know that uh Recruiting and retaining talent is one of the biggest challenges that we all have as as business people. So, you know, it's vital from that perspective as well. Yeah. But just to remember that I suppose 
businesses are rooted in society they're not they're not things that live outside we, we all we all work and we all live in in our communities and we all care about our communities and our families and the wider mm -hmm. world so you know they, they're not things to be kind of separated out it's it's how do we do we make sure that they're integrated in the way that works but certainly mm -hmm. that that um that compulsory due diligence is 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 coming and it's it would be important for businesses to prepare themselves and their ways to do that and as i say it doesn't need to be something that's scary it's something that can be quite manageable and can mm -hmm. offer great opportunities i believe to business yeah too. yeah so it's interesting the opportunities cashing in on that consumer sentiment but then attracting and retaining talent from the new generation especially as well um, in terms of the, the cases you mentioned and the legal implications, does that cover their entire supply chains and if they're buying inputs um, from companies of products that have been manufactured overseas, do they have responsibility for their entire supply chain? It will. And it, it, it will mean that, that um, you know, workers in, in um, for example, in an in industry in Colombia that's connected with an Irish company, uh, whose whose human rights are being breached because of something that the supplier to that company is doing will have the right to to litigate in Ireland against the parent. So I mean that that's 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 the way it's shaping up. So and as I say that that's the example that we've seen from France already where this is this is already in place. So it, it is it is potentially very serious for companies. But I mean I don't want to paint it as the stick either. I mean that's the stick that needs it's needed to be yeah. there. Yeah. it's really the carrot of you know why why is it a good thing to do most mm -hmm. companies want to do the right thing most companies want to have a sustainable future no company wants to deliberately or even inadvertently cause human rights abuses mm -hmm. anywhere in their organization and yeah. no doubt would be would be shamed if, if that happened so this is about being preemptive and being aware and and then coming up with solutions to to issues and and there will be issues but coming up you know with reasonable solutions that can can mitigate and then can remedy where necessary. Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, it's great to think that the European legislation can have such a wide ranging global impact than and raise the standard across the world, you know. Um, closely related to the topic of human rights and of course is climate change. And, um, you know, it's, it's so topical this particular week and last week with COP26 happening in Glasgow. And often we think of climate change as something that might affect our children, or our children's children, but of course, in, in the developing world, we're seeing the real impact of climate change already on human rights. You know, is it all of the same principles again applied to the role of business in tackling climate change, or is there something very specific that they can do now in developing countries to assist with that? I suppose adaptation to climate change as well as mitigating their contribution to it. Absolutely. Well, well, this is the. I mean. Obviously, it's it's uh, it's everywhere at the moment. Um, we've been working on what we call climate justice as Oxfam for over a decade now, um, and you know, obviously, we're we're present at COP. Uh, I, I'm not there because the carbon footprint uh, wouldn't be wouldn't be sensible. But I do have some some of the team were there, uh, meeting with Minister Coveney, meeting with Minister Ryan, and of course, engaging in the in the broader discussions. Mm -hmm. um, some you know I, your your point about it being real and being now is is so pertinent and um, i i brought tony Connolly from rte to malawi and um, it's probably eight or ten years ago now uh to to document some of the impacts of climate already at that point where farmers that knew when to plant knew knew when harvest should come you know that everything had changed because droughts happened when they wouldn't normally happen uh, sudden floods happened and then no rain for ages and so on and it was having a, a huge impact on on their world and on their livelihoods and on hunger and and human rights in the area i mean people may not realize this but the syrian conflict is is also linked in many ways to to climate in that there was a what what preempted the conflict in syria was uh, several years of drought which led to a lot of uh, social turbulence within the country which then subsequently led to the the protests which led to the riots which led to the ultimately led to the conflict so it's it's probably the first global uh, climate conflict um, and then the implications of what happens in syria for every part of the world including this part of the world and um, where people fleeing for their lives and trying to find their way to europe so it is it is very real and it is happening now and even in this part of the world uh, the us is spending about a hundred billion dollars a year um, because of the impacts of hurricanes and, and wildfires mm -hmm. 
So, uh, and we know ourselves pl problems with flooding and and so on. So, you know, there was a there was a question at one point whether it was real or not. I think everybody now knows that it is, and yeah. um, but it's but it has different impacts. And like so many things, uh, so many issues of inequality has different impacts depending on where you are, where you were born. Mm. And obviously, it has an existential and a life impact for people in poorer countries. I mean, we the fear is that huge parts of Bangladesh and many other countries will be submerged. We see Pacific Islands that are already being submerged. Um, I don't know if people might have seen some of the footage from from uh, the COP where um, some of the delegates from the Pacific Islands, uh, you know, th they actually did their presentation from inside water because it's just to demonstrate that the islands are actually now being covered. And then, you know, I don't know if anybody saw Mary Robinson last night, who's been obviously a very strong climate justice advocate for many years, crying. Uh, and it's Mary Robinson isn't somebody that, that cries that, e that easily. I've worked with Mary for years uh, with this possibility that if the agreement doesn't reach, doesn't isn't more ambitious than what it cur what currently looks to be on the table, we're talking about 2.4 degrees, um, and that is just not sustainable. So, you know, it is a it is a huge issue for all of us. And um, it's a huge justice issue. I mean, the 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 richest one percent are likely to um, exceed the one point five degrees by thirty times in the next ten years. And um, the entire carbon footprint of Africa is about two percent of global uh, carbon emissions. So you know, the fact is that we have caused this problem in this part of the world, uh, and it's it's our duty to to set it right. And the two things that you mentioned are mitigation and adaptation. So mitigation is looking to transform our way of creating and using energy. Um, and that is something that, you know, can't be put off and it can't be, you know, it, it can't be horse traded between different com countries. Um, and, you know, because there is there is a finite amount of carbon that we can we can use there. There, there are there's lots of um, kind of well intended uh views on on what's called uh, zero or net zero by 2050 but that often means uh depending on a forest putting forests in places where forests have never been before uh you know a very large part of the planet would have to be newly uh, forested in order for that to mm -hmm. be successful and also depending on technologies that don't exist yet so i mean the truth of it is we need to we need to mitigate i.e we need to drop emissions very very rapidly uh, and on the on the adaptation side, what what we need to see and what we need to see from COP is a is a is a fund which should be a hundred billion dollars a year to allow developing countries to to compensate and to adapt uh, to the changes that are that are already happening. They they don't have any choice over this. They didn't create it. They didn't cause it. It's happening on their back door. It's happening in their communities. So how do they build flood defenses? How do they find alternative ways of um, having a, an, a, a viable agricultural system and so on, and how do they protect their cities and their towns? And, and of course, there are the, all the health implications as well. So that's what we've been looking for from COP. It's not certainly not there yet, but I mean, we we, we still always travel in hope. So mm -hmm. let's let's see where that goes. Then in, in terms of um, businesses themselves, I mean, they're you know, businesses will have to will have to become more aware of their of their carbon footprint. It is it is not dissimilar to the to, to the human rights argument although different in some ways in that um, it's a lot closer to home, I suppose. Um, and, you know, there are decisions that we can make um, it to, to reduce our carbon footprint. I mean, look, you know, if you think about the way we've made, managed to transform our businesses and our lives in the last 18 months in ways that would have been unthinkable to us yeah. um, two years ago, you know, if you, this, exactly this time two years ago, we would never have dreamt of, of changing our businesses the way we do, but we did and we survived. And in actual fact, businesses uh, were more productive than they had been, uh, more profitable depending on what kind of business you're in, uh, and and got through it. So the, I mean, the pandemic created an urgency that was, you know, was unfortunate, but actually created this sense of, a, of an urgency. Climate needs to do exactly the same, and mm -hmm. it, it's us all to do that too. So there's a, there's a transformation that has to happen, and we, we all have to be part of it. Yeah. And I think the power of science as well is very reassuring when we see how we could develop and roll out and vaccinate, albeit in the developed world, a majority of people. I mean, it gives us great confidence for the types of technologies that can be developed to allow us to mitigate um, our emissions and our climate change impact. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, it would be remiss of me, seeing as you gave me the opportunity to mention <laughs> 
uh, to not mention that we are campaigning for what's called a people's vaccine. So to ensure that the, the rest of the world gets vaccinated, bearing mm -hmm. in mind that only 2% of developing countries, adults are currently vaccinated because the glut is, is here in the global north. So anyway, that's for another day. But maybe just pick that up. Um, and, you know, is that due to the EU have made so many vaccines available to developing countries? Have other developed governments? Is it, is it a blockage due to government support or commercial support or? Well, there, there, there are two, there are two, um, there are two areas. One is what's called Covax, which is this voluntary scheme where uh, this part of the world donates mm. vaccines so they can be distributed, uh, and that that's not working because it's done on a voluntary basis. And it's, I think, about fourteen percent of what's required has actually been given, um, and you know, and it's not. It was never going to work. We never believed it would work. And then there's the the wider, more difficult challenge of the possibility of having some kind of a waiver over intellectual property rights, so that mm. uh, other parts of the world can can create can deliver vaccines uh, under license or whatever uh, to to scale up in a way that's needed. So that's kind of what we are looking for. And that that is uh, Ireland and the EU are are one of are, are part of the world that are currently blocking blocking the waiver the trips waiver as, as it's called with the WTO. Mm -hmm. Interesting, the US and a hundred other countries have supported it, so it is it is being blocked by this part of the world. So hopefully that okay. that will change over time. Yeah, okay. controversial. Yeah. Um, so c coming back to climate change and COP twenty six, I suppose is all about government sign up to agreement, but no more than human rights. Maybe business can move the dial faster than government can. And I suppose when I think of the food industry, I've heard food businesses say, "Well, actually, in our business to business partnership." We're getting a demand for measuring and lowering our carbon footprint for years before there has been any real government policy on trying to to implement that at the farm level. Do you think that businesses as well can can drive forward the climate movement maybe faster than COP twenty six might? One hundred percent. And and interestingly, I was I was at the Sustainable uh, Development uh, Goals uh, conference in twenty fifteen. I was involved in negotiating there and. One of the things that really struck me more than anything else was the was the level of engagement by businesses. There were thousands of businesses involved, and um, there was uh, I remember vividly there was a full page ad taken out in the New York Times. This was at the UN, and um, by business leaders in America looking to put greater pressure on their own government to have more ambitious targets, uh, because they understand businesses understand that sustainability in business will only happen if the environment allows it, and. Mm -hmm. um, so there is there is leadership there and there's a there is an understanding there um but you put this also the you know the the very strong lobby of the of the extractives industry that that are you know are very, very involved in cop and very in, engaged and you know have their own have their own you know their own desires but look there are there are very progressive companies who understand the the issues who are miles ahead of where governments are at and are are progressing in that way and you know we've been very fortunate to work with a lot of them and you know even in ireland uh, we've been working over the last few years and you, you mentioned textiles earlier and just to give you one example um we're working with with companies like burberry cna and um, mns and and some other and some irish companies that um that we haven't we haven't got public relationships we've got private relationships in terms of their own uh, both their supply chains and and their you know their their surplus uh, materials. So in the textile industry, so um, the textile is the fourth largest cause of pollution in the world, and environmental pressure. And um, it's the second worst polluter. It's ten percent of the world's greenhouse emissions. Uh, so it's worse than um, travel and shipping combined, which I think is something we wouldn't have known until we do, until you think about it. And there are two hundred twenty five thousand tons of clothing dumped in Irish landfill every year. So massive, massive carbon uh, impact there. So we're working with those companies and a number of others to look at uh, developing the circular economy so that uh, things, whether they're they're um, at the end of fashion lines or whether they're at the end of yeah. use uh, by consumers can be put back through, both through our retail network and through other ways of, of um, reusing the materials and that. So there's, there is, plenty happening in those kinds of spaces mm. and there certainly seems to be a, a desire by companies and an understanding by companies that mm. partnering with organizations like ourselves can can help with that mm -hmm. but certainly again the demands are going to be there the the pressures will be there from consumers i mean the irish 
uh, youth movement on climate is is very powerful and very strong and and mm. audible. I mean, they're you know they they really have have created a lot of waves. So, um, you know, it it will be important. But it's 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 vital anyway. Look, I mean, this yeah. there's we don't have a choice in this. It it just has yeah. to happen. Um, yeah. And it's it and again, I do believe there there will be plenty of opportunities, uh, competitive opportunities for progressive companies to 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 steal a, a march on others if they if they if they put the the investment and time and energy into it now. Yeah. And as you say, I think the next generation of consumers are more sustainability conscious and aware of fast fashion and all of the well, negative I mean, impacts it has. Well some of us may 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 uh, we we may not live to see the the time when this is is having the huge impacts mm. here uh as it is elsewhere but but they won't uh, so i mean they're they're right <laughs> and we should yeah. we should feel the same if we care about yeah. our children and our grandchildren and we do so yeah. um it's it's not a it's not a case of of if we can it's how we do it mm. excellent so look the last topic jim maybe before we start to finish up is the role of investors in the climate change agenda as well we talked about it in human rights there and maybe tell us a little bit about, um, you mentioned Maureen McGuinness, EU Commissioner for Financial Services, the whole movement towards sustainable finance, impact investment, green finance. How is that shaping up? And in your view, can it have a real impact on climate change? Well, it, it will. I mean, it's it's follow the money, right? So, I mean, if if these uh, funds, and I, I mentioned some of them from earlier, um, Dutch fund ABP, um, the investors for human rights, but also the, the human rights, they, they see that, they see climate as part of their human rights mandates. Mm -hmm. The two things are are absolutely connected. I mean, you can't separate them out. And um, the, as I say, BlackRock and, and others, Fidelity International, are, they're, they're looking to to move the money into places where where uh, green and sustainable um, development and, and economies are happening. So, you know, and we would see also, I, I believe, pressures at the European level for a, for greater percentages being required of of investment funds, a greater pressure on investment funds to to ensure that their their money has been invested in a way that that protects the environment, that doesn't cause damage and cause harm. And look, you've seen. Um, Texaco uh, Exxon Mobil has been delisted off the New York Stock Exchange because the the people are moving money away from those kind of shares. So mm -hmm. it's very real and it's happening. Um, and you know, we businesses will go where the money goes, of course, and you know the, where the investment goes. So it's it's positive that those very powerful institutions are are you know pushing ahead and putting on the kind of pressures that they need to. Mm -hmm. But. Um, it is, you know, it, it still needs to happen and happen faster. And, you know, the the knock on impacts of what businesses actually do themselves may take longer than that. And you know, we need to see that moving faster. Mm -hmm. And as I say, and business is putting pressure on governments too. I mean, the, you know, we, we need to see our own government and governments across Europe and across the northern part of the world uh, moving a lot faster than they're moving. And, you know, and look, the, you know, we, we know that uh, Irish industry some elements of Irish industry are particularly, you know, vulnerable, I guess, to to the to to climate and to the to the use of carbon because of the nature of the of the business. You know, the, the elephant in the room is the is the cow in the room, I suppose. And you know, and and but it's you know, certainly this has never been the, the fault of farmers. You know, this is this is what we need to see is what we call a just transition, a, a transition that that allows farming to change in a way that protects livelihoods of farmers, adds value to what they can do, whether it's producing beef or producing other things, uh, and then does it in a way that creates a sustainable economy, which is is you know needs to happen. So there's 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 a lot to be done here, and it's challenging, but it, it is possible and it is doable. And and other other countries are are moving ahead. I mean, the Danes have have been working on these areas for many years, and they've they've invested hugely in in wind power it, in in fact so far as far back as the the oil crisis of the 70s they recognized that that wind was a uh, was something that they should be thinking about so they're you know we need to catch up and we need to to move faster but look i mean we have a very i think we have a very agile economy we have a very um a very smart kind of uh, business leadership in in ireland that that has to adapt has to adapt to brexit has to adapt to whatever might be happening in the european union you know and and have to adapt over the last mm -hmm. eight months 
we're adaptable, we're agile, we're we're capable, and and we're imaginative, and we can we can do things. So mm. it's it's really for me about about you know energizing that and and really really realizing that this is this is vital and urgent, and we can do something about it. Yeah. Good. I mean, despite all the serious challenges we're facing from climate change and human rights crises and COVID and Brexit, you even mentioned there. Sorry You're still giving us great, uh, great cause for optimism, I think, in terms of, of the power of business leaders and the business community and all of us as consumers to make a difference and to, to play a role in, in solving these problems. So I think it's it's a positive message you have really for the people listening to us tonight, isn't it? One hundred percent. I mean, it's easy to feel helpless and and that these challenges are so huge and so insurmountable. But look, we we, we all have power, whether we be business yeah. leaders or, or consumers or individuals. Um, and but as business leaders, the the leadership is expected of us and and you and me and 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 people in the room. And you know, we we need to be part of the transformation, and we can be. But it will benefit all of us. It'll benefit our mm-hmm. communities, our families, and ultimately, it'll benefit our businesses too. So. The opportunities there uh it's not without its challenges but the there's there's great potential and uh, and i'm sure that people will rise to the challenge yeah. that's great jim so maybe one last question before we finish up and we received questions in advance and i i think i've picked most of them up but for people tuning in tonight some of our early career or uh, recent graduates that would like to pursue a more meaningful career where they could make a real impact what kind of advice do you have for them on where they could get started or some reflections on your own career over the years well i i would say start where you are i mean uh, you know this this meaningful career thing sorry i know and i i i it makes me a bit uncomfortable i have to confess <laughs> i mean I, I think everybody on this call has a meaningful career okay um, maybe bad choice of words but... <laughs> i know i know you were being kind of doing something but, more or yeah but, but look i mean the the, the point is that you know, if you work in, in in banking, if you work in agriculture, if you work in um, in service provision, uh, you know there are things that you can do in your in your world that will that will actually make a big difference. Um, and I think it's it's having that sense of connectedness to to what matters and and how change can be made. Uh, certainly, we're we're always looking for for talented people uh, in in our uh, line of work. Um, and you know we're looking to to partner with businesses and to partner with people too. So we're we're very open to to any kind of discussions that we have there. I, I'd be very happy to talk to people if if anybody wants to, to reach out mm-hmm. to me about a, a particular career path. Mine was a, a bit circuitous. I kind of kind of ended up here rather than <laughs> designing mm-hmm. to, to be here. And I'm very happy and 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 privileged that I am. But um, certainly very happy to 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 give people any any ideas. But I think the the message for me really is is. What you do is important and if you do it well it can actually make a big difference in people's lives and to be aware of that and to be aware of where the challenges might be and to to step up to them that's great jim thank you i think all the best careers were circuitous ones so well done and thank you look i think you you've given us great food for thought in terms of what all of us can do as consumers and the products we buy and how we spend and invest our money um and looking for better products and better investment plans uh, lobbying our public representatives and in our day-to-day lives in whatever career we have that we all have that opportunity to to make a difference whether it's combating climate change or raising human rights across the the uh, the world so Jim thank you very much not only for this evening but for everything you do uh, for UCC um, personally I'd like to thank you for all the time you give to the business school you have played a really important role in shaping our new strategic vision which is around developing responsible leaders for a sustainable future. So we're really trying to embed these concepts of responsible management and sustainable business into all of our programs and research in the business school. And you've had a really positive influence in that regard. And I think have had a really important voice in reminding people that the business world and the needs of the developing world don't have to be very far apart, actually, that they are very closely aligned. And you remind us of that regularly. And it's really, I suppose, been factored into our own strategy and in what we want to achieve ourselves as a business school. So thank you very much, Jim, both for that and for the discussion tonight. I can't believe our hour is up already. The time absolutely flew. We didn't even get to to touch on gender issues, which was on my list as well. So we'll have to do it again, Karen. So over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Definitely. And yeah, thank you very much, Jim and Thea. It was a really informative discussion on how companies and organizations can drive positive change in achieving sustainability and protecting and supporting human rights. We'd also like to thank everyone who joined us this evening and to let everyone know that this talk will also be available to view afterwards on the university's YouTube channel. Um, next month, Alumni and Development will host our annual Christmas homecoming, and we'll share details of that soon. But for now, thanks again very much, Jim and Thea, and we'd like to wish everyone a nice evening. Thank you.